The Little Mermaid, Ariel to the rescue. Oh, Eric, this is wonderful, Ariel said as she twirled around the ballroom with her prince. I can dance with you and see the ocean from here. She still missed her sea friends sometimes, but she loved being with Eric. The next morning, Prince Eric caught up with Ariel walking along the beach. He knew she was hoping to visit with Flounder and Sebastian and her other friends from the sea, but they didn't seem to be around. Together, they watched the waves crash onto the shore. Maybe it's too rough for the fish to come this close, Prince Eric said. We'll figure out a way to bring the land and sea together. Don't worry, Ariel. At dusk, Ariel went to Eric. I was thinking about what you said earlier. I want to show you something, she said. She led the prince to the quiet lagoon they had rowed in long ago. Do you think my friends would feel safer visiting me here? Ariel asked. Eric rubbed his chin. Hmm, maybe, he replied, suddenly getting an idea. He had to make sure it would work, though, before he said anything to Ariel. Weeks later, Eric told Ariel that he had a surprise. He led her to the lagoon and showed her a new wall. It was big enough to keep out sharks, but it had a gate so her friends could swim in any time. In fact, Flounder, Scuttle, and Sebastian were all there to greet her. Isn't this a great idea, Scuttle exclaimed. Ariel was thrilled. Oh, Eric, I love it, she said. Ariel was so excited that she waded into the water to greet her friends. Then she saw something swimming. Look, a small dolphin leaped out of the water. He's just a baby, Ariel said. Where's your mother, Flounder asked the dolphin. But the baby raced away. Poor little guy, Flounder said. He seems scared of me. But the princess didn't give up. She coaxed the baby to swim to her. Still, he looked very sad. I bet your mother is on the other side of that wall, said Flounder. Don't worry, we'll find her for you. But a few days later, Sebastian and Flounder still hadn't found her. This is terrible, Sebastian said. Ariel decided that the very next day, she would ask her other under-the-sea friends for help. Late that night, Ariel awoke to thunder. From her window, she saw huge waves crashing onto the shore. The baby dolphin must be terrified, she told Eric. We have to see if he's all right. Eric followed Ariel out into the stormy night. When they arrived at the lagoon, Flounder was already there trying to calm the baby dolphin down. Ariel climbed onto the lagoon wall and called to the sea creatures. Help me, please. I'm Ariel, princess of the seas. I need my father, King Triton. A whale was the first to respond. Then a school of fish splashed their fins. Thank you, the princess shouted as the sea creatures raced to find the king. At last, there was a flash of light and King Triton appeared. The storm quieted down and the baby dolphin's mother swam up to the gate, frantically trying to get in. Oh dear, the gate won't open. She can't get in, Ariel exclaimed. King Triton raised his trident. Swim back, everyone, he said. Then he took aim and a bolt of lightning blasted the whole lagoon wall down. First, the mother and baby dolphins swam to each other. Then they swam up to King Triton to give him their thanks. Then, at last, they swam up and playfully splashed the prince and princess with their tails. I think that means we're forgiven, Ariel told Prince Eric, laughing.
The end. Aladdin, the desert race. Jasmine and Aladdin were strolling across the palace grounds one evening when the Sultan ran out onto the balcony. Drat, he cried. Oh, drat, 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 that dratted desert race. Jasmine was surprised. Usually, her father loved the desert race. Every year, the best riders from Agrabah competed against those of the neighboring kingdom of Zagrabah. The fastest horse and rider were awarded the prized Golden Palm Trophy. What's the matter, father? Jasmine asked. The Sultan shook his head sadly. I just heard that Prince Faiz will be riding for Zagrabah again. His horse is so fast, he's won the race the last three years. I have an idea, father, said Jasmine. I could ride midnight in the race. He's the fastest horse in Agrabah. Oh no, the Sultan said. The desert race can be dangerous. I won't have my daughter risking her neck. How about if I ride midnight in the race? Aladdin spoke up. The Sultan's face brightened immediately. What a splendid idea! You'll have such fun, my boy, he cried. The next day, Aladdin and Jasmine went to the stables. Aladdin climbed on Midnight's back, but within moments, the horse had tossed him high in the air. Here, let me try, said Jasmine. She climbed into the saddle, and Midnight carried her around the ring. She was the only rider Midnight had ever had, and that was how he wanted it to stay. Sorry, Jasmine told Aladdin. I guess Midnight is a one-person horse. Now how are we supposed to win that trophy back? The Sultan asked. Let me ride in the race, father, Jasmine urged him, but the Sultan turned away. Perhaps we can find you another fast horse, the Sultan told Aladdin. He didn't look hopeful, though. Don't worry, said Aladdin. I'll think of something. But what? The day of the race arrived, along with the riders from Zagrabah. Prince Faiz rode his white stallion, Desert Warrior. I don't know why we brought the Golden Palm Trophy, he said. We'll just have to carry it back. The riders took their places at the starting line as fans from both kingdoms gathered to watch. The Sultan looked at Aladdin. What an odd-looking horse that boy is riding, he thought. Then the Sultan looked for Jasmine, but she was nowhere to be found. Where is she? It's time to start the race. At last, he couldn't wait any longer. He raised the start flag. One, two, Three, go, he cried. The riders galloped into the desert, and a black horse with a mysterious veiled rider took the lead right away. As soon as they were out of view of the palace, the rider threw off the veil. It was Jasmine. I do hate going against father's wishes, she whispered to Midnight, but I just had to prove you were the fastest. Jasmine, gasped Aladdin as soon as he saw her. But just then, his horse spotted an oasis. Now that's more like it, the horse exclaimed. It jumped into the cool, inviting water and turned into a seahorse instantly. Hey, that wasn't part of the plan, cried Aladdin. Don't worry, Al, the genie said. We'll catch up. Gotta stay hydrated, you know. Back on land, Jasmine and Midnight galloped off without a backward glance. Faiz and Desert Warrior were starting to catch up. They were shocked when they saw the princess. Faiz did not want to lose to her. Jasmine urged Midnight on, but Desert Warrior pulled ahead. Give up now, Faiz shouted. That trophy will always belong to Zagrabah. Not so fast, Jasmine called back laughing as Midnight surged past Desert Warrior. Faiz and Warrior stayed on Midnight's heels. 
until they came to a ditch. Midnight sailed over easily, but warriors skidded to a halt. With Faiz and Warrior out of the running, there was nothing to stop Midnight now. Then suddenly, Aladdin appeared on his mystery horse. Jasmine knew that no matter who won now, the trophy would stay in Agrabah. But she really wanted to prove that Midnight was the fastest horse of all. Midnight pulled ahead, then Aladdin's horse took the lead. But when they finally crossed the finish line, it was a perfect tie. Congratulations, Aladdin told Jasmine. Same to you, Jasmine replied. But where did you find such a fast horse? Surprise, the genie cried, changing back into his usual form. We were just horsing around. It was my idea, explained Aladdin. I couldn't bear the thought of Zagreba winning again this year. Oh dear, said the Sultan. The winner must be a horse and rider, not a genie and rider, I'm afraid. That disqualifies you two from the race. And that means Jasmine and Midnight are the winners, the Sultan proclaimed proudly. The trophy was theirs. Midnight had beaten even a magic genie. Now that was fast. The End Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, a big surprise. Snow White and her prince lived happily at their castle. But ever since she'd left the dwarfs' cottage, she tried to visit them as much as she could. One spring day, she paid a visit, planning a very special surprise. Snow White knew the dwarfs worked hard, and that day she wanted to make sure that when they got home, they wouldn't have any more work to do. No dusting, no sweeping, and no cooking. She waited until the dwarfs had left. Then Snow White and her animal friends hurried into the cottage. The princess looked around. By the time the dwarfs get home tonight, our surprise will be ready. Right away, they set to work. Snow White sang a cheerful song as she swept the cottage floor. The birds picked up crumbs, and the squirrels used their fluffy tails to dust. The chipmunks and the deer washed and dried the breakfast dishes. With so many helpers, Snow White had the downstairs gleaming in no time at all. Next, they went upstairs to make the seven little beds. Pull the covers up tight, the princess told the bunnies. Then fold down the top. There, it's perfect. You did a wonderful job. Soon the cottage was all tidy, and Snow White headed outside. She knew the dwarfs would be hungry after their long day. Luckily, the blueberry bushes were full of ripe fruit. We can make the dwarfs blueberry pie for dessert. Then the princess and her friends strolled into the meadow to pick some flowers. Lovely, said Snow White as she sniffed a blossom. These will make their table so very pretty. Back inside the cottage, Snow White and her friends got to work fixing supper. There was soup to be simmered, bread to be made, and pie to be baked. Before she knew it, the sun was low in the western sky. Tweet, tweet, chirp, chirp, a bluebird sang outside the window to tell Snow White that the dwarfs were almost home. Snow White ran and hid outside and peeked in through a window. She watched the dwarfs walk in and stop and stare. The floors were swept, the room was tidy, there was even a fresh pie cooling on the windowsill. What is that delicious smell, Doc wondered. Look, cried Grumpy. He pointed to the table, which had been set. Then he went to the pot of soup. Someone's been in our house. The dwarfs were confused. They tried to guess which dwarf had done it all. Doc noticed that Happy's smile was especially big. Was he keeping a secret? Doc wondered. 
Dopey pointed out that Sneezy seemed super sneezy. Was it because he had dusted and swept the cottage? Snow White giggled and listened outside the window. They'll never guess that we did it, she whispered to her animal friends. And when the dwarfs began to eat the pie, Snow White quietly headed home. Inside the cottage, Bashful had one more guess. Whoever was behind the surprise would have to be one tired dwarf. And who seemed the sleepiest? Why, Sleepy, of course. The truth was, Sleepy wasn't the only one. After a long workday, and with their tummies pleasantly full, all seven dwarfs were ready to go to bed. And so they made their way upstairs, where they found one last treat. Seven neatly made beds and seven perfectly fluffed pillows. The dwarfs had one thought as they drifted off to sleep. They had to tell Snow White about this wonderful surprise the next time they saw her. The End <laughs>